Hi folks, um, welcome to this presentation on data anonymization and offline data link. Um, so my name is Pratap, so I work as a platform engineer at LinkedIn. Um, so one of the other colleagues who will be accompanying me is Arjun Sharma, who is also a platform engineer at LinkedIn. Um, so together what we'll do is we'll be walking you through the, the whole anonymization process. Um, uh, where are various good practices that you can uh, take away from this presentation. So the agenda is going to be as such. Uh, one, we are going to talk about the GDPR compliant access. Um, the second, we are also going to give a, just a glimpse of how big the data ecosystem at LinkedIn uh, in order for people to be able to appreciate the problem at scale. Uh, second, the next thing that we are going to introduce you to is um, some of the uh, tech stacks that we have leveraged, uh, which is DALI Data Hub, uh, and of course, uh, Apache Goblin as well. Um, so we'll be walking you through some um, processes around real-time obfuscation, write-time obfuscation, uh, and if time permits, we'll talk about the differential privacy. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the challenges and uh, some of the uh, monitoring aspects uh, that you guys can probably leverage in your projects. So with that, um, so GDPR is uh, a term that has been coined somewhere around 27, 2018. Uh, the general data protection regulation uh, gives more control to the users, um, of especially of EU origin. Um, so what? So there are various, various guidelines and uh, you know, the rules that have been imposed by GDPR um, with respect to the data privacy. Um, and uh, anyone who is not adhering to those privacy, or companies who seem to have breached those privacy, tend to apply. Uh, paying a fine of 4% uh, of their administrative fines. Um, so the reason why we are just emphasizing, uh, I mean, we are emphasizing about GDPR, but there are other complaints, uh, enforcements also that will be covered as part of this design, which includes a CCPA, uh, a bit about IDPC, and any intra-country uh, policies that might be applicable on top of your data uh, could also be covered. Uh, it says that GDPR covers a whole subset of, whole superset of uh, uh, rules and policies, um, and the other policies like CCPA and uh, IDPC are sort of a subset of GDPR. So, and, and hence we are emphasizing more on the GDPR Act. Um, so, the interpretation of PIA uh, provided by the GDPR Council is as such. Which means any user, any record that can uniquely pinpoint to a user will be treated as a PI in a nutshell. Um, so there should not be any um, data, data, any attributes in your data that can uniquely identify a customer or a user directly. So anything as such would be termed as a PI. Uh, now by the definition, quite a could probably look small. It could be a five line or a six line definition. Uh, but the the whole, if, if you start looking at the PA aspects, it's quite large. Um, now, some of the examples that we have laid out here have got to do with the city, the state, the region, the device ID, the IP address from which a user logged in, uh, a user email ID, uh, any any sort of logs that are being captured by the user or the user ID means. So these all become the PA. Uh, but uh, at LinkedIn, we have nearly 50 plus uh, PIA attributes that uh, identify our data uh, as PIA. Um, and uh, as and when we find opportunities, we sort of evolve and uh, you know make make more PIA attributes. Uh, but what you're seeing here is just eight of those several PIA attributes uh, that we use at LinkedIn. Now, GDPR uh, rightly says that you know each user or user user uh, um, use user data has to be protected, and uh, the core value of LinkedIn and a uh, parent company Microsoft is very uh, nicely resonates with that. Right. So what we believe in um, is also to um, we respect our members' uh, data, their privacy. Um, it's important for us to maintain their trust, right? Uh, the second thing also, we also want the users to be aware or 
cognizant about the sort of data uh, that we are collecting and how we use it. Uh, and LinkedIn uh, very strongly believes in these uh, mission statements. Um, and also, if you observe our core values, our member comes first, and every engineer at LinkedIn acts like an owner. Um, so, in conjunction with just in conjunction with the GDPR guidelines, uh, which also aligns with our core values, uh, and what we are going to see is a reflection of both the GDPR, the CCPA, and our core values. So, why anonymization, right? So. Uh, one on one side, the article Article 32, one of the GDPR dictates that you know there needs to be uh, a sort of in encryption that needs to be applied on top of your data, right? Um, so that's that's one uh, angle to it. Second thing, we also want to have all tools and utilities in place to ensure we also protect our users' data either by encrypting the data at risk. Or encrypting the data in transit, or um, you know, always give an encrypted to the end customers or the users of the data, um, uh, and thereby also reducing the probability of any data breaches if at all if they tend to occur, or if there are any AVS drop that happens, uh, that almost nullifies the probability of a data breach, uh, and thus uh, we solve the anonymization problem. And um, I'm sure other companies are also attempting the same in their uh, what you're going to speak in this presentation are some of the uh, good practices that can be followed. Um, and we'll walk you through some of those prerequisites for following those best practices and the best practices. In um, so in order for us to be able to understand and the diversity of the data, uh, we'll just give you a glimpse on how the data ecosystem at LinkedIn looks like. Um, so our members' data is everywhere, right? Like for example, you see your profile. Uh, your profile details are stored in some system. Your profile picture, your um, your uh, career background, your job change history. Uh, so there are systems that are tracking the audit events, and there are systems that are storing the information form of documents. Uh, there are systems, uh, there are in most key value stores that are tracking um, persisting your data in some way. Now, the data is several heterogeneous sources of data are available um, at LinkedIn. Now, what we are going to focus in this presentation is just the Hadoop angle to it, which is an offline angle. Um, there could be other talks which cover uh, the data anonymization and the source system level. Uh, but in this talk, we are only going to emphasize the data anonymization part on the Hadoop ecosystem element. Um, as you see here, so we have uh, we have campaign management system, we have key values tools, we have documents tool, uh, we have our own uh, front-end services in emptying a lot of events. Um, we have batch load data or derived data also having uh, been represented in this uh, in this whole LinkedIn ecosystem. So eventually, all of this data lands on Hadoop. And Hadoop is our, uh, our data lake is built on top of Hadoop, right? And uh, our data data lake scale is several petabyte scale, and our nodes are in the order of several thousands of nodes. Um, so that's the scale that we are doing, and the data footprint is huge, and the data diversity is also very vast. So the pro what's the problem with uh, such a big ecosystem, right? Um, one, you have a heterogeneous data. Uh, as you see, we saw structured data. We have logs data being ingested. We have uh, events data being ingested. We have a document and the value stores data. Now, the data is heterogeneous. Um, so we have a combination of uh, all three, the variety of data, the volume of data, the velocity of data is uh, is what you can clearly experience from that previous diagram. Um, this heterogeneous data, so we will eventually have to um, land on the Hadoop, right? For for analytical needs or AI needs or uh, other data mining needs. Okay. Uh, secondly, the data access as such is also different for different data sets. Now, data sets which uh, which have high highly confidential information or confidential information. Has absolutely 
a zero access to any data. Uh, but having said that, how would we determine if the data set has uh, highly confidential low confidential information? So that's another thing. Now, for the same data set, you have different views. What we mean by that is a user can, there is a HDFS data set. Now you can have a hive registration on top of the HDFS data set. One can have a managed hive table uh, for a given data set. Um, there could be a RDB, or if you're using Spark, you could have a RDB, uh, RDB for your data set. Um, uh, Presto also can also give you, can also sit on top of your HDFS and view, uh, can also be used for your uh, computation. So that gives, so there are different views of the same data. The semantic variability is also huge. Now, users can choose to use Spark for their computing needs. Uh, um, Big is another way, Hive is another way, MapReduce is another, another way. So the, the semantic variability is also very diverse. Right? There is no unique, there is no one hard and fast rule of um, uh, accessing your data. Uh, the next thing is the customization. Now, when there are data, then there are uh, there are legal aspects also that come into picture wherein for some legal needs, if you want to um, persist your data for you for some legal needs, if you want to restrict data access or you just don't want to expose, uh, you just don't want to uh, you know, uh, remove any data uh, unless and until those legal obligations are met. So those customizations can also be imposed on that um, data. And of course, needless to say, we have different file formats. Companies choose to use Avros, OSDs, Parquets, and there are heterogeneous file formats, right? Um, and we also have the volume, share volume of data is also in the order of setup. So now with all these parameters uh, uh, to be considered when, in order to ensure that, you know, we have a compliant data, right? So all of these parameters uh, needs to be addressed in order for us to be uh, having the compliant data analysis. Um, so this is how the representation of uh, heterogeneous optimal system. Right now you have HDFS. Um, it, it is at the sole discretion of the user uh, to use the acceptable tools and utilities. Uh, right? So a company can have or has uh, provision high and spark and sums and many people would want and the uh, and the end users are free to use any of the tech stacks. Now, uh, with each of these tech stacks, the the ways of uh, the ways that your readers are implemented, the way your studies are implemented, the way you access your uh, data, right? It's it's it, it varies from system to system. Um, so that's one problem. Um, another problem is you now once you provide these systems, once you once the users are using the system. Uh, the other challenges could be that you know, users could have hard coded files. Um, some users can choose to use uh, their, can write their own custom UDFs to access a certain SDFS path or a high data set. Um, again, there could be very tight coupling with Avros or ORCs or Parquets. Uh, and the data model evolutions are also very hard to handle when you have such things. Right now, that, that's it's a hard problem. Now, how do we really mitigate uh, such a problem? So, a uh, problem can actually be solved. So, this is a ten thousand feet view. So, one way of or uh, one way of solving this problem is uh, have a unified access layer or a unified data access layer uh, on top of HDFS, so that you know everyone, uh, every application that is accessing HDFS will have to go through this unified data layer. Um, so that is a, that's one of the easier ways to solve. So if we could solve this problem of unified data access, um, then um, we can, so it's like uh, a major milestone or a hurdle uh, achieved uh, in the whole compliance story. So what helps us solve this uh, data unification layer or creating a data, unified data layer uh, is the DALI. Uh, which is the data access at um, So this, so for more information on DALI, you can actually go to this uh, engineering blog, uh, which gives you more insight on what DALI, uh, what DALI does. So essentially what DALI is uh, solving for us is um, 
So we have heterogeneous uh, input formats. We have different types of uh, file formats and the table formats. Um, there is no, so how can we unify all of this? Now, if you look at database uh, management systems, this problem um, is solved uh, to very great effects. Now, um, if you take any DBM system, now how the partitioning is done, how the data is laid on your desk, how the statistics are collected, where the stats are stored, um, how the data is laid out on your desk, uh, what data structures are used to um, access your data uh, is sort of abstracted uh, if you look at it down there, right? So the all, uh, all that the end user is cognizant about is their registered database and their existed table and the, all the low level details are abstracted from the end user. So the use end user always gets uh, uh, a view of a DB and a table as, as a row and a column format. Uh, and that's exactly what DALI is trying to abstract uh, or unify for us. Um, so DALI is DALI tooling and DALI readers together. What this solve is, um, if there is a HDFS neighbor and a user is wanting to access a data set using Spark or using um, or using um, Big or using Hive um, or any any other scripting mechanism. Uh, what DALI does is the DALI has a mapping for your underneath Hive table or your HDFS data set. Um, end user queries uh, your DALI data set, which in turn uh, we are the DALI tooling queries are underneath HDFS data set. Now the DALI layer actually plays as a plays a role of uh, abstraction layer. Um, now, if there were to if um, the organization were to pivot from one file format to another, let's say from Avro to OS, now the end users need not do this, um, need not handle this file format, the new file formats in their way. So because DALI has already abstracted that for you, all you need to do is leverage DALI readers and DALI is intelligent enough to get use on what sort of readers to need. Right? Um, likewise, um, if your data were to be partitioned or if you were to migrate into a new table format, um, so DALI will actually be enhanced to accommodate those new table formats uh, and the end user will not be uh, uh, exposed to any of those changes happening in the system. Uh, so this this is uh, how DALI solves that problem for this, right? So um, HDFS, um, there is a DALI layer on top of HDFS. Now, any of the users who wants to apply the transformation uh, or read their data uh, uh, will have to go through this DALI layer uh, and which actually is it's on top of HDFS. Uh, now, in a nutshell, if you see here, all we have to do is we have to inject a library at this DALI layer and the the compliance can actually be achieved just by injecting the compliance library into the DALI reader. Uh, what happens if when a user actually queries this HDFS data that we are DALI, uh, this data actually passes through this compliance library and the outcome of this is a compliant data set, which means the 50 plus attributes that we spoke about in the beginning when we were defining PIA, all of those attributes, uh, all those attributes that uh, that associate to, uh, that are associated to one of those PI types uh, will automatically get anonymized, and uh, the user gets uh, only an encrypted version of the data, and your uh, data, which is the raw data, which is uh, encrypted at rest and uh, is not uh, exposed to the user. Right. So what this complaints library can essentially do is either it can null out or obfuscate or filter out any of those uh, complaints uh, data that, that is there in your HDF. Uh, the intelligence of how it is done uh, is what is uh, what is encoded into your compliance library. So this is one of the strategy of achieving uh, uh, and DALI actually help to solve that problem. The next uh, tech stack that helps us solve the problem of compliance or anonymization is Data Hub. Uh, so Data Hub uh, is a V2 version of a warehouse that was open source a few years back. But this is pre-GDPR. Um, so even before GDPR, we had the data lineage uh, in place uh, and has been outsourced 
oh, and has been open sourced as a hero suite. Um, so when GDPR and other compliance uh, uh, policies or the regulations came in, so we were uh, ready to actually you know, enhance the warehouse suite uh, uh, with, uh, with the means of annotating the data. Right. So what essentially Data Hub does is uh, for any given data set, it uh, actually has uh, your schema metadata. It unifies all sorts of diverse data sets and their schemas and they normalizes them into a common format. Um, the, the micro level details that are stored uh, in Data Hub is at a field level. So which means for any given data set, you would know the lineage of the data set. Uh, you would know the annotations against the data set. You have the compliance type. Uh, if there, if the, if, uh, right for erasure, if that needs to be imposed on top of a data set, that information and the metadata is also available in the data hub. So the data hub uh, engineering blog, uh, the engineering engineering blog covers, um, more aspects of the data hub. Uh, but data hub data catalog is what helps us, um, uh, provide us the metadata that is required for us to determine if a data set holds PIA or non PIA data. Right? So we have covered two aspects of it. So one, we have covered the, the unification layer, which or the data access layer, uh, which sits on top of HDFS, um, which, uh, you know, which, which is the step one of um, uh, nailing the compliance problem. And the second one is the data hub, which acts as an input for providing as the metadata or the uh, PI, whether if a data set holds PI or non PI information. So, uh, as in conjunction with these two, uh, uh, we can solve the uh, we'll see as to how we are solving the complex problem. Um, alongside, what we'll also see is uh, leveraging Goblin. Um, so, Goblin is also our. Uh, uh, it's an Apache Goblin project. It's an incubation uh, stage at the moment. Uh, so Goblin acts as our data ingestion pipeline, uh, which uh, very well. Uh, it's, a, it's it's actually a backbone of LinkedIn. Uh, Goblin acts as an extraction, transformation, and load layer. Um, it can read from various sources and it can write to various. Uh, we'll see how uh, Goblin in conjunction with. Uh, Data Hub and DALI also sponsor an organization for that. Okay. Uh, now, here is how the compliance transformations under the hood look like. Right? Um, if, uh, I mean, so this this is a framework which is already provided by Hive, and we are uh, leveraging that framework, right? So, this is one of the strategies. Um, the strategies being so, uh, there is an operator tree. So, once uh, uh, query is executed. Uh, there are query passes which generate a query plan and a operator. Right? So that comes out as an uh, outcome of your query pass. Now, what essentially happens is um, uh, the table scan operator uh, is the first uh, that reads your data. Uh, if there was, if there is a filter operator, the filter operator filters your data. And then you have your column projection and the user sees their data. Now, what we are doing here is uh, adding the, we have something called as the anonymization operator. Now, this is where our intelligence lies on um, how we can actually anonymize the data. Uh, now the same table scan operator scans your data even before filters and transformations can occur on top of your data. This anonymization operator is taking this following inputs. Now, what it does is the, the metadata that is provided by the data hub, it takes that as input. It takes the query context as input. It takes other privacy settings that might be uh, available at data level as input. Right? Uh, and what comes out as an output of this is, the, is anonymized data. The data is encrypted. Uh, now the recipe is wherein uh, this the means to anonymize the data is actually uh, inbuilt into this anonymization operator. So also when the scan operator varies the HTTPS data set, so this uh, the DALI layer is what takes care of um, uh, you know uh, 
ensuring it, the the one to one mapping with your NFS database data sets to value that data set is taking care here. So this anonymization operator uh, is abstracted from users. Um, so it is actually deployed onto a cluster. So what happens when a user queries a data? Um, uh, it actually goes through this route. It gets anonymized, and we always get uh, uh, encrypted data. So this is one of the strategies. Right? Um, so some of the uh, we have also seen uh, diverse data sets. We have seen uh, diverse file formats. We have seen structured and unstructured data. Uh, we also have uh, urns and composite urns at uh, LinkedIn. So wherein uh, this is one, one of the uh, standardized approaches that we follow as well, wherein um, along with the metadata that is provided to you via metadata catalog system, uh, you also have metadata along with the data itself if you if it were in form of the um, For example, uh, if there were contracts being sourced from various channels, uh, let's say channel 1000 has a contract 100, so this is how it would look like. Uh, if you also consider a retail example, uh, customer buying uh, items. Uh, so that can be uh, earn ally, customer column, earn ally, item column, item number, followed by the customer number. So well, the advantage that we get with this is even uh, even without a data catalog, um, even without the data catalog layer, we know that you know the data. Uh, we have the data and the metadata going hand in hand, right? So uh, this is also one of the uh, good or the better practices that has been in place for a very long time. Now we have we spoke about uh, the data catalog. We spoke about the DALI layer. Um, now all we need to do is to use the read the data via the DALI layer. Um, the metadata get the metadata the data have talks to. The DAL layer speaks the data hub layer. Uh, and uh, yeah, so together we have a good uh, a harmony there. Uh, now, what Goblin does for us is this is how the Goblin pipeline works. So, this is a Goblin framework. Um, so, Goblin essentially breaks down your big chunk of work into smaller and achievable smaller chunks of work. And each work is uh, each part of this work unit uh, deals with extraction. Transformation and load your data into destination cluster. Now, why this slide is important is because one of the strategies uh, in data anonymization is to create a um, copy of your uh, uh, copy of your primary data lake. So, it, if, if if you have a primary data lake which is which has uh, zero access to your user community, uh, whereas you want uh, 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 you want a user community only access the anonymized data. Now you can use tooling such as Goblin to actually extract your data. Um, you do your transformations uh, at the time of extraction, uh, and then you persist your data into a secondary data lake with, with your core data sets. So that that's one way of achieving that uh, uh, anonymization. Now the second way of achieving uh, anonymization is read time anonymization, uh, which means you have so in the primary approach the the disadvantages of such an approach is um, uh, the or the cons of such an approach is uh, whatever data you have on your primary cluster uh, will have uh, will be replicated from a secondary data lake cluster, uh, which means uh, your your data footprint is twice the size. Right, so you need twice the uh, you need the same capacity as your primary cluster on your secondary cluster as well, uh, at least for your core data sets. Right. Now, how could we actually solve that problem through read, uh, read time anonymization? Right. So, one of the framework that could be leveraged again, uh, or one of the uh, strategies that has already been provided uh, via Hivers to leverage uh, LLAP. Um, so, this is a uh, long living process. Um, this is provided by uh, the Hive framework itself. Um, so what this, uh, what Hadoop LLAP does for you is, um, it can actually cache your data as well as, um, um, you know, cache your metadata. And uh, it can it can actually cache your encrypted data uh, via LLAP. 
So what this means is each time a data set undergoes some transformation, um, you will have your data cached uh, and your associated metadata also cached into this uh, layer uh, because uh, LLAP is a long running demo which is available on all your nodes. So with this process, um, you can with this approach also you can achieve uh, anonymization. Uh, the second approach is a DALI reader proxy approach. Um, in this DALI reader process, uh, so DALI readers, so you can read more details on DALI reader from our open source documentation. Um, uh, so the LinkedIn uh, blogs, uh, Zen blogs. Uh, so what DALI reader proxy will do is, uh, so DALI reader is so. All underneath HDFS accesses will be revoked. If at all, if a user has to read uh, any data set, uh, he will have to go through all, all the processes will have to go through this uh, DALI reader proxy route, wherein this DALI proxy will have the, will proxy as a super user uh, based on your authentication and authorization privileges. Um, it will give you either a anonymized view or a prompt. Uh, so that's what the DALI reader proxy approach will take care of. So, so the control of uh, your authentication authorization uh, and the the and the view that needs to be presented to an end user at the time of the query uh, is what will be decided by the DALI reader proxy. So the, this is the second approach that uh, we were wanting to do. Um, the third the third approach uh, that we had was uh, leverage DALI writer. Um, so, like, we have achieved unification in reading all our data sets, heterogeneous data sets from heterogeneous text stacks with the DALI reader. Uh, we are also, uh, DALI writer is yet another approach uh, wherein the users can uh, achieve anonymization. Okay, so wherein the logic of uh, anonymization is embedded into the DALI writer itself. Um, so, so that, you know, whenever the uh, if the data is persisted, uh, the data is automatically anonymized and then persisted. Right? Um, if the user wants, they can also persist the data parallelly, wherein one copy, uh, the, the DALI writer is cognizant or can handle um, one uh, parallel write, which is uh, an anonymized version, and second, which is an anonymized version. Uh, wherein the end users can only access uh, the anonymized version by the read time anonymization that we just covered in the previous slide. Um, now, the other monitoring angle also we wanted to cover now. Uh, so, we spoke, we discussed about the data at scale. So, we had different types of data sets. Um, um, we have a uh, variety of data sets, variety of data set formats. Um, so, if you Observe what we have explained in this in this uh, presentation is that you know every data set has to adhere to DALI uh, DALI file DALI form. Uh, second is uh, one of the prerequisites is I mean DALI is an unset tool. Uh, the first one is that annotation completeness. Uh, we want all data sets um, to have hundred percent annotation completeness. Uh, without annotation completeness, the users will not be able to access data set. Um, and if the only means of uh, accessing a data set is via annotation. Um, the second thing is once the annotations are in place, um, how we uh, determine or monitor the data set is based on those four KPIs. And now the data staleness being data staleness being um, you have a raw copy. Uh, but your anonymized copy uh, between uh, your raw copy has actually been uh, updated either because of a backfill um, or some annotations have changed for your data set. Uh, so such changes also have to be um, uh, imposed or applied on top of your uh, anonymized data lake. So we use this API called as data staleness uh, to keep track of how many such data sets are actually stable. So our SLAs uh, we keep uh, as short as four hours uh, to ensure all the data across all the cluster, all uh, all the data uh, uh, which is user facing uh, uh, ha have uh, the freshness, data freshness in number of runs. 
Um, the data incompleteness is um, uh, we understand that you know, no matter how much how many rules we impose, uh, probably because of uh, uh, because of our legacy, if there were any data sets we do not adhere to our data model, um, uh, what we do is uh, we give one percent tolerance uh, for that data set, which means uh, if your data set holds one percent of the records. Uh, which do not have a data type, uh, which have an incompatible data type uh, with your PIA, uh, we drop those records. But if it is more than one person, uh, that data set never is made available to the users. Uh, the, the next category is a missing KPI. Uh, what missing KPI means is your data set is available, your raw data set is available, but either the user have not provided their annotations um, or the users uh, or your uh, annotations do not go hand in hand with your data types, right? Uh, like for example, you have an ID which is of integer type, uh, but someone said that you know uh, it is an integer uh, value, but has a uh, but the annotation was mentioned which is of string type. So these are incompatible. Uh, so what we do is we do not uh, uh, we do not even attempt. Uh, anonymization against the data set, which means the users will not be able to access this data set unless and until they correct them. So that's another KPI that we use to keep track of our uh, missing data sets and keep the users uh, intimated on this. Uh, the second, the last one is the data locking. Um, so we have a stringent data model review committee. We have stewards and shepherds um, who review the data. Um, our data and their metadata. So our metadata are always checked in and kept in. Uh, uh, we always follow Git-based check-in process for all the metadata. But we, in spite of that, we have our uh, detection algorithms, uh, which keep crawl, which keeps crawling on our data to see if there are uh, any data set annotations that do not go well with the data. Um, so what we do is we immediately log those data sets. We immediately restrict the uh, data set access for those. Um, we create a ticket to the users. Um, we, um, we would um, involve the house security um, and uh, only after um, only after the necessary annotations have been either corrected or when justification was provided, will this be uh, open for the user consumption. Um, so this, this is a monitoring story uh, um, around uh, the anonymization uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, so in view of time, I think we will uh, submit a blog on the uh, on data, uh, on how we add noise to our data and stuff. Uh, so that can be for, submitted as part of a blog. Uh, but I think we are uh, done with our presentation. Um, and thanks guys, thanks for your time. Thanks for attending this session. Okay, so uh, that was a great session, lot very informative, and um, we don't have uh, Pratap today. Uh, so we have one question from Swapnil. Um, is it possible to implementation of DALI Hadoop in in uh, .NET or application SW development? Um, Bhupendra, if you could answer that, please. So, uh, is it possible to implementation of DALI Hadoop in .NET? Yeah, of course it is possible, uh, but then. I would say, uh, so DALI provides an abstraction today over the Hadoop data lake, right? And then on top of that, you can always add a layer which can be, lang uh, I mean, which is independent of the language which uh, your application is using, right? So on top of that, you can have a layer which is language agnostic. And I, I mean, uh, you can have like a RESTly API, you can have like a thrift protocol, you can have a REST protocol, and that layer can be, you know, uh, your application can be in any language and then DALI just works as is. So is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. But um, yeah, I mean, I would suggest to add one more layer and your uh, it is independent of, you know, what uh, your application uh, language is.